Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Bible time. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of Matthew this morning, and today we are in chapter 5, which means we're in this incredible bit of scripture called the Sermon on the Mount. It's the first sermon that Jesus gives that is recorded in great detail. So if Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit, decides that that is something important that needed to be recorded that way, we want to give it some special attention. So we're going to go through this really slowly, <clears throat> up to one verse, uh, a sermon. Now, why did uh, why is this called the Sermon on the Mount? Well, there's some great big fancy reason for that. It's because he spoke to them and preached on a mountainside. It's as deep as that. <clears throat> so there's lots to get through. Let's look at our first two verses as introduction. First one, seeing the crowds, he went up the mountainside. There is your Sermon on the Mount bit. He went up the mountainside, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... Now, this section begins with something we call the Beatitudes. The, the word Beatitude comes from the Latin, and it means happiness or bliss. Okay? Um, because because when, when he opened, Jesus opens this sermon, he, he starts with these ten attributes for mankind that should make us, if we, if we embrace them, should make us exceedingly happy. And I think right now, with lockdown and being in winter... It's a great time to have some uh, things that would make us exceedingly happy, right? So each sentence starts off with the word blessed are. Uh, blessed are these people with this attitude. And he tells us why they will be happy. Um, um, blessed is from the Greek word makarios. And it means supremely blessed. Not just like I'm in a good mood. No, I'm in a really, this is great. I'm super happy. Or well off. <clears throat> and what Jesus is talking about here is the inward joy of a Christian that does not depend on the physical, temporal circumstances. He's talking about our hearts. Uh, this is not a superficial well uh, feeling of well-being based on our circumstances. Um, and, and we want that. We, we want that, right? Because we know how short-lived uh, uh, circumstantial happiness is. Um, it's just been Christmas, so we realize more than ever, perhaps, that retail therapy has an incredibly short shelf life. And what makes this passage even more striking is that Jesus then associates this makarios, this supremely blessedness, with negative things. Like being poor, or those that mourn, or those that are hungry, or persecuted. And we go, what? Now, what's this about Jesus? This is not the things that we think will make us happy. It sounds more like misery to me, to be honest. But in Jesus' kingdom, Jesus teaches us that these things, endured for the right reasons, in the right way, is the key to happiness. Now, not long ago, Andrew taught us through the book of Ecclesiastes, and we saw Solomon take, test every human desire. Something that we will never have the resources to do. Um, and he came to a conclusion which would be the same as our conclusion. I know people would turn around and say, oh, I wish I could test it for myself. But it would be the same conclusion is that there is nothing in the world that will bring spiritual or even lasting physical contentment. And yet as Christians, isn't it so sad but true that we continue to try and meet spiritual needs with physical things? We seem determined to believe that an easy life is the same as a content life, despite the huge list of suicides that we have by wealthy and famous people that speak contrary to that. But instead Jesus says, Blessed is the man or woman who trusts in the, what the Lord says will bring about peace and contentment. You know, he talked about this in 1 John, uh, Jesus said, uh, excuse me, in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, the apostle wrote, Do not love the world or the things in the world, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with all its desires, but whoever does the will of God will abide forever. 
Jesus is really, in, he's throwing everything upside down as he normally does. He's introducing us to a new way of life, one very different from the examples set by the Pharisees and Sadducees. In Jesus' time, it's a life lived to the spirit, not to the sinful flesh. It's a new way of life for the new creation in Christ. You know, we have several new, uh, newish Christians in our church right now. And from my own experience, some 20 plus years ago, um, I think that as much as this is one of the most joyful times in your life, it's also one of the most confusing and scary, vulnerable times in your life. As you're learning to see what that, that the, what the world offers you and may even seem good to you is a lie. It is, in fact, destructive to your life uh, when the Bible tells us that it's at odds with what the world uh, may be speaking or teaching us. And I think you're going to get a taste of that today. Today we're going to look at the first blessing. Um, and by the way, throughout the year, I think as we look through all these Beatitudes, I am happy to report back that um, you will not only hear my monotone voice with a weird accent, you will indeed uh, uh, hear people coming up to help teach on this, Audrey, Gordon, and John Dunlop. I'm really looking forward to that. <clears throat> but what did Jesus say? What's the first thing that Jesus said in his sermon? Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, <clears throat> for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <sighs> Let's look at that in full short points uh, or questions what does it mean this poor in spirit what does it mean what does it look like why is it important to our lives and 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 how can we achieve it so let's start with that what what does this mean what does it mean to be poor in spirit what is i don't even know what that you know what jesus is on about Blessed, makarios, supremely happy are the poor in spirit this word uh, in the greek means a lot more than we may first gather from the English language. You remember the woman who dropped two mites into the offering at the synagogue? And she was really poor, um, and she was unknowingly commended by Jesus. Uh, in Luke 21, she was poor. But this word has an even stronger meaning to that. Phtochos, if I get that right. Phtochos, it means destitute. It, uh, it means more destitute than the word poor. It's a step lower than being poor. It was used of uh, beggars living on the street. They were so desperate and so ashamed. They would beg with they would beg with one hand covering their face and no one could recognize them. Their other hand held up in desperation because they were unable to fend for themselves in any way whatsoever. It's someone that is completely and utterly at the mercy of another. Has no way of gaining anything themselves. <clears throat> and yet, what is this? What is this word "spirit" added in here? It's because Jesus is not talking about material poverty. And Greek scholars have triple checked this, done all the work for us. That's why it says "poor in spirit," because apart from God, we are spiritually phtochos, okay, destitute. We are lost. We are hopeless, we are helpless apart from God. And no matter what your education, your wealth, your social status may suggest, that isn't indeed the fact. Day after day we live as if these worldly things matter and give us meaning. Um, I, I've often wondered about this, I could be wrong, but you know, at least for men, uh, you meet someone new, you do the handshake, and one of the first things that people say, so what do you do for a living? As if that mattered. And because uh, material success, uh, we can, not always, not always, but we can become the opposite of phtochos, of the heart. We become proud. That's the opposite of this. <clears throat> and so what does it look like? Um, we'll talk about both sides of the coin here. Um, we think that we are something special if we excel in areas of education, wealth, social status. We get that little, perhaps, secret joy <clears throat> inside when someone asks us what we do for a living, as I've suggested. We can look down on others with less education and training. 
And, you know, we can, we can sit around a table with other people who have achieved the same as us and talk about our wealth and what we do with it and, and where we should be on our career ladder. And, of course, we don't do it as directly as that. Very discreet, very tasteful, of course. Um, and I know what that's like. I did that in South Africa. Um, um, but we do it as if we had a choice into which part of the world, which family we would be born into, which body we would be born into that it has afforded us all those opportunities to achieve. Um, career and income are, of course, one of the easiest ways we begin to think more of ourselves than we should. It's a great danger. But pride is not just for the well-resourced, is it? Do you know that most of the time when you run down others, it is because you're trying to prop up your fragile ego? You feel someone else has a better house or car or sporting ability in you, and they secretly rock the boat of your own prideful self-worth. And so you bring them down. Not, not face-to-face, of course. Uh, well, for most people, it's not face-to-face. -face. Usually, if you do it face-to-face, -face, it's in the form of a joke, isn't it? You know, Many are true words said in jest, as the old saying goes. But notice how we only really run down people we think are on the same par with us, or even higher on the world's ecosystem. Ever talked about a BMW driver before? Um, uh, sorry if you own one of those. <laughs> we don't, but we don't really run down anyone we consider lower than us in status because why not? Because they're no threat to our prideful hearts. And you know we don't just do this as individuals. We couples are great at it. We we consider other couples and and um, <clears throat> and question uh, their actions in a negative, sinful manner. I bet if we were honest, there would be very few couples that were not guilty of running another down. Why? To bring us up high. And the really sad thing is that once <laughs> I do believe this is really, really sad, but once our kids start getting older, we begin to include them. And we end up training them on how to run others down to make themselves feel good. Once again, never directly. Usually comes in the form of a joke. Everyone's laughing around the table in the lounge together at another family's expense. But our true motive is threatened pride. You see, pride is one of the most powerful areas of sin in our life. It permeates through just about everything. It's the reason mankind fell. Satan said to Adam and Eve, you know, eat this. You will be like God. Ooh, that sounds like a good idea, Eve said. It's the very reason Satan fell as he tried to set himself up to be like God. It's, um, it really does permeate. I, I think of this bag, like a goldfish in the bag. You get like a goldfish in or something, but perhaps a bit thicker. Um, and you take a pin and you prick it at different bits. And no matter what area of your life you stab, sinful pride will come pouring out of that. <clears throat> pride fills us with the arrogance to think that we do not need to pray in order to help others. It makes us think that we do not need help ourselves, or excuse me, that we, that we can get help for ourselves without praying. Pride, I think as well, here's another one, I think shows itself up in men's friendships. Uh, women, it would seem to me anyway, are quite often able to open up quite quickly and share their heart with other women. Uh, but men <laughs> almost never get past the superficial. And God, think about this, God has determined that no one person would have all the spiritual gifts within themselves. Why? To make sure we realize that we need each other. Think about that in the body of Christ. We need each other. Yet we're so determined to live apart from each other. We have to start opening up, especially men. And there's probably many reasons for that, uh, cultural pressure and TV and so on. But I do think that pride is a major component that stops that from happening. Now, I just want to make a quick sub point here. Um, just a very, very short one. Why am I trying to pinpoint actual pride, pride in the daily sort of working of our lives here? Well, I read a sentence last year that I don't think I'm ever going to forget, and it's probably going to permeate my preaching for the rest of my life. But it said that 
that if we pr- I paraphrase this, but it says if we preach in great generalities, the congregation will all nod in agreement, but there will be very little change. Instead, we need to take that scripture and apply it to the actual lives of the congregation, albeit uncomfortable, so that people can see a roadmap for change, if indeed they actually want to. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Beatitude coming in verse 6, I can't wait for that. Are you truly hungry and thirsty for change? I know that I need this change in my life, and I'll bet you do too. Perhaps perhaps this is a, a piercing question for home group this week. How do you see pride working in your actual life? That we can confess to each other and pray for each other. That would be the heart of Christ in this. Who will be brave enough not to deflect that question in great, swathing, general answers. Who? Let's go back. In Revelation 3, Jesus speaks to the church that's become lukewarm. Famous verses. He says, I know your works. They're neither hot nor cold. Oh, that you were just hot and cold. So on. But in verse 17, he tells them why they are lukewarm. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. And I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. See, to be poor in spirit is to realize all of this. That without Jesus, we are so spiritually wretched, pitiable, poor, and blind, and naked. No matter how good you think you look on the outside, and no matter what false front that you put up, and how hard you try and hide it, you are spiritually destitute. We are needy people with an unbearable load of sin debt on our backs that needs to be paid for. There is absolutely no hope of saving ourselves. Our only hope is to hope and beg for mercy from God. And I'll get to this good news in a minute. Um, but let's let's consider our third question. Why? Okay, so we, we understand what it is. We understand some, just a tiny bit, uh, the tip of the iceberg of how this plays out in our lives, how destructive it can be, how it can stop meaningful relationship and hurt people and stop us from building good relationship as well. But why why else is it more important in the spiritual side of our hearts? Um, There is an actual reason why Jesus... Uh, that says this as the first thing in his sermon. I mean, this is God preaching now. It's not random. It's like me. It's, it's, it's every word is in its right place. Why does Jesus say this first? Now, I believe the answer is relatively simple. It's because humility is the foundation and, or, or gateway to all other teaching. John MacArthur said this. I'll read this to you. He said, until a soul is humbled, until the inner person is poor in spirit, Christ can never become dear because he is obscured by self. Until one knows how helpless, how worthless and sinful he is in himself, he can never see how mighty, how worthy and glorious Christ is in himself. Until one sees how doomed he is, he cannot see what a redeemer the Lord is. Until one sees his own poverty, he cannot see God's riches. And only when one admits to his own deadness can Christ give him life. And Christ does desperately want to give us life. That is the good news we call the gospel. Listen to this scripture verse. <clears throat> and G- that Jesus Christ who, Jesus Christ who, verse 6, Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, God made us. He knows how spiritually destitute we are because of our own decisions to sin. And so he still came to redeem us, to purchase us, 
the destitute beggars with his very own blood. To take that guilt, to take the wrath of God for our sins so we don't have to. And now having bought us with a heavy, heavy price, he's waiting to pick us up, to wash us clean, to put new clothes on our back and, may, and prepare a seat for us at his table. But unless people can get over themselves and see themselves for what they really are, they will never bow to their king, never ask for his help, and never enter his kingdom. And there's a mixture there for both Christians and non-Christians. Because for all of us who are already Christians, who have bound, who have asked for forgiveness, do we ask for help? Are we immune to this? Not at all. A matter of fact, in, in Africa, and I, I think I may have shared this before, but in Africa, it's said that you can take an orphan child <clears throat> who was destitute, feed him, clothe him, give him shelter, and he will be extremely grateful. But give them as little as six months, and he will begin to complain about his food, his clothes, and his shelter. Six months. When we become Christians, we're filled with the joy of knowing this great love. Like, oh my goodness, God loves me. Because I know who I am, but he loves me. And we realize we're saved from death. And yes, we go through tough times, but, but God loves me and he saved me. And, and heaven awaits. The new heaven and earth, it awaits. All the suffering will come to an end. There will be complete list of joy. Oh, this is amazing. But it does not take long before we forget how destitute we once were and we start to think we can do it all on our own. That we can decide what it means to live for Christ. We set the bar and begin to take the Bible for granted. Christians will never grow in dependence on God, never grow in love and admiration for God. We will never accomplish much, much for Jesus as we try to do it all on our own. Remember the branches and the vine and the fruit from John? We might as well expect fruit to grow without a tree. We will never pray as we ought to. We will never care for others deeply while we think we are something special and don't recognize the fact that we are empty inside so we can make space for the Holy Spirit. How do we achieve this? How do, we, how do we escape prideful hearts? Uh, it's funny to read about how people have tried to do that over the years, many different ways. Monks separated themselves from the world, followed strict rules of self-denial. The problem is it's our heart, not our bodies. You'll gain nothing by selling all your possessions, really, um, <clears throat> to some degree, if that's your primary uh, point of achievement there. Um, mutilation has been the most extreme example. People flogging themselves, the blood pouring out their backs. But guess what? They're already destitute and Jesus died to take away their sins so they don't have to whip themselves. Ironically, self-mutilation does give a person a reason to boast on what they've done. It's weird that pride is found even there. Actually, there's nothing to be done outwardly. It is all inward. The way we can begin to practice and train our minds for renewal in, the, in this way is, is, is very simple. It's simply by acknowledging it and keeping it at the forefront of our prayers so we can truly say, you know best, Lord, your will be done. Keep it at the forefront of our daily activities so we can ask for help and be grateful. This is one of the other reasons why I'm such a, uh, uh, you know, I promote prayer in the morning. So that you can you can set forward your attitude for the rest of the day and go, Lord, I need you, I need you to protect you, to protect me from myself, and go out trained and, and prayed up on that. Um, and of course, you can pray whenever you want, just to make that clear. But I, I'm just my own personal habits. Um, but I I know this sound, may sound a bit simple. That's what I'm a bit worried about. It's not simple. This is a powerful way to counter attack, to pray through the amazing grace of God. I once was blind, but now I do see because of you, Jesus, and that old hymn. So, 
So maybe if you are blessed with material possessions, um, you can see it as a gift from God, not of your own achievement, because you could have been born in the poorest alleyways of, of an Asian ghetto. Maybe you can see it as a gift from God and bless others. Let's, let's keep this knowledge on the, on the tip of our tongues so that we know we don't have to run anybody down. We are all destitute together, every one of us, and we can be only be saved and redeemed by the mercy and grace of God, which he is prepared to give us as demonstrated on the cross. What's the point of running other people down as destitute as yourself? There's What is there to gain? It is so silly that we do this. Instead of doing that, maybe we can think about how to build each other up and carry each other's burdens, encourage one another as we all eagerly await the full salvation of the Lord. And as we grow in this community mindset, maybe we'll be less fearful of sharing, uh, people will be less fearful of sharing their hearts and actually say, Lord, I need you. Guys, pray for me. Um, yeah, it really does wipe away every foolish and lofty thought we have about ourselves. It does allow for sober thinking and a caring heart. And the humility of it all, it certainly does. It opens up our heart to Jesus, to teach us, to say, Lord, you know best, your will be done. I have no strength. It's in your strength that's going to happen. It makes us moldable in the Father's hand instead of trying to stop it and say, no, Lord, not here. Do this, do that. Lord, we are destitute. You know everything. And we allow him to mold us into the image of his son. This is why I think it's the first, one of the other reasons I think it's one of the it's the first of the ten beatitudes is and we don't have time to look into this but I think it closely relates to the first of the ten commandments you know you shall have no other gods before me even yourself especially yourself oh to grab a hold of this also allows us to drop every care and worry into the Lord's capable hands and become good disciples of Jesus. No wonder the reward for all this, which we haven't looked at really, is such a huge blessing. I'll just read it to you and you can think this through in your own time. But it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why, Lord, why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are not filled with pride and think they know more than God, but who humble themselves under their Lord. Oh, their reward is heaven for the humble. Let's pray. Um, Father God, you are precious. You wipe away all our, all our foolishness of, of how great we think we are. We are nothing. We are destitute destined for the wrath of God because of the things we have done, not because of your unkindness, because of what we have done. And yet you went to the cross. You emptied yourself of the glory of the of, of heaven. You came incarnate as a 100% man, 100% God. And Jesus, you died on the cross to wipe away our sin because you loved us so much. There was not an ounce of pride in you. You washed the disciples' feet hours before you knew you knew Judas would betray you. And yet, Lord, we struggle to forgive people for silly little things. How foolish we are. Lord, I, I pray that you would bless us this week with a clear mind. And that your Holy Spirit would remind us of what we looked at today as we're going through our day-to-day uh, living uh, as, as bosses and colleagues annoy us, clients annoy us, as as we as we struggle for issues of self worth amongst friends. Lord, help us to remember how destitute we all are, and how much you have come to save us all equally. Lord, we pray for your help to love one another as a church, to uh, to. We pray for hearts that would share with each other. Lord, we struggle with this once again. 
Um, let us be a church that depends on one another. So Lord, we give these things over to you. And we, we wait expectantly for your Holy Spirit to continue uh, to bring this out in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.